This is an Atari 1200XL and I'm selling it. Hello and welcome to another video from Flash Jazz Cat. And as you can see on the desk here I've got a lovely 1200XL. Well I say lovely, uh, it's not the nicest colour. I don't know if you can even appreciate the, the swirly discoloration on the case on this machine but uh, yeah it's not uh, it's not very nice at all. Now this is my Atari 1200XL or one of my Atari 1200XLs that I've had for a long long time and it's actually the one that about 12 years ago or so, 10 or 12 years ago, I dramatically upgraded this machine and altered it very very aggressively. It was one of the first projects I suppose of that magnitude that I'd done at the time and it was the only 1200XL I had uh, at the time so I was sort of in two minds about it and uh, yeah it was very drastic. I did actually document it on the Atari Age forum in a blog I think the reason, one of the uh, things that inspired me to actually start doing this modification was the uh, rediscovery of the uh, tong boards. So that the, I think that was the Atari 1400 XL and 1450. I think, was it Best Electronics had a supply of them over in California and people were buying them up and assembling them. And of course, the for, for example, the 1400 had a case very similar to that of the 1200XL, although the uh, joystick ports weren't angled at the side, but it had the PBI connector on the back of the machine, as well as a speech synthesizer. And of course, the 1450 had the uh, parallel floppy disk controller, etc, etc. So I thought, I called the blog the poor man's 1200XL. Um, I was even poorer then than I am now, actually, but... And I decided I'd try and transform my 1200XL into something approximating a 1400XL in terms of functionality and looks. But yeah, I really went to town on this one. And there's a lot of what was at the time quite expensive upgrades in here. I think I've, I've, I've fixed or either possibly replaced the keyboard eventually. Because I've now got four... Uh, if you include this one, I've got four 1200XLs in total. And all of the other ones I've got are basically stock. So I've got basically three more or less stock 1200XLs in reasonable condition. Most of them have gone yellow, but I've never really touched them. I think Bob did the um, his video mod on one of the boards before he sent it in. So eventually, out of, out of the three, I'll upgrade one of them and I'll keep the other two stock, I would imagine. Now, with all that in mind, I've kind of gone off this machine... And uh, coincidentally, about, it must have been well over a year ago, somebody actually got in touch with me uh, from America, and he must have read about this machine or seen it on a video or something, and he expressed an interest in actually buying it from me. And he's offered a, quite a generous amount of money, I have to say. And of course, we moved house. I, I said that I was uh, open to the idea, and I, I, thought his, uh, I thought the price he was suggesting was very uh, agreeable. But of course we moved house and I've had no time to do anything with it. But he got in touch with me again, um, I was towards the end of the last year or the beginning of this year, asking if, the, if I was still interested in selling the machine, if it was still available. Yes I am, and it is. The arrangement he's suggesting now is even more agreeable than the previous time, so we must really want this machine, because I suppose the, the selling point is the parallel bus and the all the upgrades that it's got inside, which I'll show you in a minute. So I've just about got to the point now because obviously if he's paying a considerable sum of money for this machine actually it'll probably pay for me flat roof <laughs> pretty much so that's uh that's one of the reasons i want to get on with it obviously he wants it warranted he wants it all to work and actually it was quite a number of years since i'd even turned this machine on so i dug it out the other week uh with a view to uh looking it over checking it over and uh, i've already told uh the buyer the prospective buyer about the discoloration on the case. I did retrobrite this several times previously, years ago. I did try putting uh, a protective anti-UV spray on the, on the plastic. It did absolutely no good whatsoever, so that got cleaned off. So what I've suggested I'll do, and I've done this before, and I'll link to uh, uh, the video in question. It was the Italian Job 1200XL. I ended up painting that one because it was so badly discoloured. After I did the upgrade work on it, it started to discolour again after I'd retro brighted it while it was still here. So I suggested to that customer that I'd paint the case 
and I think I made a pretty nice job of it and it looked pretty pretty much like it would out the factory and I've now got the whether I'll use it or not on this machine I don't know but I've now also got the brown shade uh, which is pretty spot on but I don't think it needs it it's mainly the the light plastic part that needs painted uh, so he's okay with that, obviously providing I do a professional job of the uh, paint job, which uh, which I am, uh, once I find or construct somewhere in the house to actually do the job. So that's what we're going to do. So we're going to fix up the internals of the computer, we're going to test it with side 3. The, 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 the buyer sent me a list of uh, must-have things, obviously as I say I want to warranty the thing so it works, it's guaranteed to work with what's in it. Uh, it needs to be compatible with side 3. Uh, it's got an internal hard disk, etc, etc. So I'll give you a peep inside anyway. Now I have already had a bit of a gander off screen at this uh, computer and a bit of a tinker on with it. Uh, and I'll show you actually what was wrong with it. So when I turned the thing on it didn't work, predictably. And the But the only things wrong with it actually, there was a, these two clock wires that come from the VBXE, uh, which is providing the uh, clock for the for the motherboard. Uh, the, both of these wires had come off. One of them's just ground, so I've left it off. So I've soldered that clock wire because I had no clock. So I got a clock then, but it still wouldn't boot up. Both of these 74LS158 chips were missing. And obviously they control uh, DRAM access, so it wasn't going to work without them on. Didn't notice that at first. I must have stolen them for another machine or another job. So I got a couple of chips, popped them in. So with the, with the clock wire resoldered on and those two missing chips, put back in. I'm going to loop this wire around. It shouldn't just be floating around like that. That's getting on me nerves. We'll do something with that later on. Anyway, so with those two problems rectified, the machine, to my amazement, just booted right up. Now, what we've got in here, it's, it's a bit busy, but uh, I'll guide you through the uh, the upgrades that we've got in here. Now, if you if you don't know about the 1200XL, this was the machine that ostensibly it was to replace the uh, the 800, uh, the Atari 800. Um, and it's a kind of a, a, a sort of a bridging uh, kind of machine between the, the 800 and the actual XL line proper. Uh, it wasn't produced for long. It was only produced uh, in NTSC format. Uh, there was never a PAL version produced, but this one has actually been converted to PAL because this was my main computer for quite a number of years, actually. Despite its size and despite the very limited uh, desk space I had back at the old place, this was the computer I used for almost everything, uh, developing firmware and stuff like that. So, uh, what did I do to the machine? Well, as I say, I took the whole power circuit off the back here. So, on a, on a standard 1200XL, I'll flash a, a picture up on the screen. It used the same power supply as an Atari 1050, an Atari 800, which was 9 volt uh, AC. And that was rectified on the motherboard. Uh, to 5 volts. I think it, I, I'm not sure if it had a 12 volt output as well, but it wasn't used on the board if it did. So all of that had to go. The rectifier and the heatsink and everything covers the whole back of the computer. And for some reason, I think it was in conversation with Candle uh, about what I was going to do. I think Candle had done this to an XEGS machine as well. Uh, I decided, sort of inspired by Candle, to use the same Centronics connector for the uh, for the parallel port. It would have been nice if it just had the same edge connector as the other XLs. Because uh, to, to uh, continue about the background of this machine, uh, it was broad out. It didn't have a parallel port, so it had no expandability. It had two joystick ports instead of the four on the 800. The cartridge port's a little bit inaccessible. They changed the uh, operating system, which broke various bits of software that worked on the 800 so it wasn't very very popular it's a it got because the, the plus points are it's got a nice keyboard it's a beautiful design uh, it introduced things like the help key and the function keys so there were some pretty cool things about the 1200 xl but it uh, it was just pre pretty crippled by the lack of uh, expandability and uh, it lacks five volts on the sio port that wasn't a big deal at the time but nowadays it is that's one of the things you need to modify. So it's a bit of a curiosity. But they're highly sought after now, 1200XL, because there's bags of room inside the case. Loads of space for upgrades. Lovely keyboard, although it always, it's always it got a, a, a permanent failure point on it, which needs to be addressed all the time. But once that's fixed, your keyboard's nice. Uh, Beautiful-looking machine. 
so they do command quite a high price certainly over here in europe and in the uk on the one hand it was probably a bit scandalous a bit uh, sort of sacrilegious to uh, modify the machine in this way but i went ahead and i did it even when it was the only 1200xl i owned and now i've got three more and uh, it's not a big deal i don't care for it it's too much of a mess i'll show you the mess when i take the board out of the machine actually but we'll go around the board and i'll tell you what's actually in it so aside from the um the pbi connector that i've fitted here and you can see the, you can look at the wiring for that uh, this is following bob bob woolley's modification by the way his instructions for adding a pbi connector uh, on the 1200 xl uh, absolutely invaluable resource bob woolley being of course the the real innovator with modifications for the 1200 xl in particular uh, so i ripped out the power supply added the uh, parallel connector on the back we've got uh, vbxe we've got ultimate one megabyte we've got the pal adapter board i think that was drop check who originally made those she doesn't want to make them anymore don't know why i don't know if she's released the uh the Gerbers or what I don't know I can't remember but anyway so that's that so it's palified now now this here the other thing it did originally have a pokey uh, a stereo pokey board which I think the buyer wants back in so we'll have to sort that out for him I don't know why I took it out I probably pinched it for something else I would imagine uh, but this here is the idea interface now this was an early I think 2005 there 2k5 an early Pasu hard disk host adapter for the 8-bit Atari and it's very very good and it's this basically the forerunner the forerunner to the uh, the IDE plus 2.0 a lot less sophisticated it doesn't have onboard Sparta DOS X or anything uh, but of course that's no problem because we have all that on the ultimate one megabyte now the thinking here was the reason that I've put this the reason I put this in the machine is because when we, at the time I put this together, I think we had side two or the side cartridge. We have contention for the cartridge port. It was important to me that I was able to use cartridges on this machine and use them alongside the hard disk. Now, as you, some of you might know that with the Ultimate 1 megabyte, we've got all the side cartridges, the original side, side two, side three, and they can work in unison. The Ultimate works in unison with any generation of side cartridge to provide a hard disk which appears to the operating system as a parallel externally connected new device um, hard disk host adapter which is all very well and good but until we had side 3 the cartridge itself did not emulate cartridges so you had the cartridge port blocked uh, with the side cartridge and no way to connect uh, other cartridges or even emulate other cartridges on the system so the thinking from my point of view was to put this in uh, which will work perfectly well alongside the ultimate one megabyte and side hard disk no problem because they're designed to work with other adapters on different ids on the bus uh, put this in and that would free up the cartridge port so if i wanted to use a cartridge i could use this hard disk that's in the machine if i didn't want to use the cartridge i could use the side two in there but of course now things have changed and this is another reason that this computer has become surplus to requirements really from my point of view is that we now have side three now side three emulates cartridges almost all the popular cartridge formats so if i get myself another 1200xl out of the cupboard and restore that and upgrade it with ultimate one megabyte and whatnot it doesn't matter that the cartridge port is taken up with the side three cartridge because what else am i going to plug into it because if any cartridge i want to run i can just put it on the sd card and emulate it so the the need for the expansion bus is pretty much deprecated now from my point of view maybe in the future something will come along which you know needs it so no problem i'll use a different machine but that's the plan anyway i'm going to get another one of the 1200 xls and upgrade it slightly less aggressively <laughs> uh, and use it as a probably leave it ntsc and use it as a test bed uh, an ntsc test bed for uh, software development the firmware on this idea interface is uh, i wrote it because at the time there was no apt so that's the Atari partition table. There was no APT firmware for this particular board. So I talked to uh, Conrad about it. He gave me a few hints and tips. I didn't I didn't want the source code from him, although he did offer it. Uh, he said if I if he gave me the source code for the original firmware, I, I couldn't release anything that I wrote. 
which is fair enough. So I did this blind, a bit like the uh, Chinese re-implementations of the uh, the IBM PC BIOS and whatnot. You would, you they would, ha they would have to re-implement it blind for legal reasons. So I've done the same thing here. So it works as an APT interface. So you can take the SD card from here and put it in a side too, and vice versa and they will work perfectly well. And this particular firmware is interesting because not only does it use the APT partitioning format, uh, but it is specifically developed for this machine, the ultimate on this machine, because the ultimate board via a plug-in stores the settings for this hard disk. And the, and the firmware on this hard disk retrieves the settings uh, from the NVRAM on the Ultimate 1 megabyte, which is interesting, but it all works beautifully. So I'll take the board out of the machine anyway, and we'll have a look at the back. Oh. And bear in mind, this used to be on standoffs. I have no idea why I took the standoffs uh, off, uh, but that it doesn't just float around in the case. It actually, it's got holes in the board, and it will sit on these standoffs once I put them back, so don't worry about that. Nothing floats around loose in the machine, so let's get rid of the case for a minute. Yeah. Uh, architectural soldering there you go uh, so excuse the soldering this was some of my earliest work I have to say but it does work uh, to my amazement but yes all of the lines go directly to the CPU so you get your address lines and your data lines and um, various other signals have to be picked off um, elsewhere and of course because the uh, the internal hard disk has its own PBI connector as well. There's actually two wires on each pin here. There's the cable going from the CPU to the connector and then from the connector to the other cable that connects to the hard disk, if that makes sense. Um, that made a lot more sense than trying to run two sets of wires straight from the CPU. Um, so by the time it gets to the idea hard disk, the signals have travelled quite a long way, but the, but it still works, and it's quite remarkable in that uh, respect. So if we go in a bit closer here, you can see uh, that there's the remains of some of the uh, of the old power connector and whatnot, and it's all been taken off and ground away. There's the DIN 13 connector for the VBXA that's coming off. That'll have to be reaffixed. And there, basically, we've got two huge. Uh, this is uh, five volt and uh, ground wires bridging the gap here, completely bypassing all the, uh, the the part of the board where the uh, huge capacitor used to be and, and the rectifier and everything. All gone. So that's the back of the board. It looks like hell on earth, but uh, it, it all works. And I'm not, I'm not really going to touch this. I'm going to clean the board, but I'm not going to replace this. What I am going to do before uh, we pr prepare the machine for sale is I'm going to replace quite a lot of this cabling here because it's gone horrible and yellow and stuff this one's okay I don't need to touch this I think that looks fine but these ones have gone all yellow they're really really old even older than some of the other modifications on the board so I'm going to re basically topically rewire the top of the board the customer also wants the the thing reverted back to NTSC which is no problem uh, we need some sort of stereo solution in here all the latest firmware obviously I'll have to uh, put the plug in for the uh, the idea on the ultimate one megabyte or an updated version thereof test everything out test it with side three and uh, That'll be it basically and of course the other thing is that we need to sort the case out So uh, anyway, I'll, I'll quickly demonstrate the machine before I throw the motherboard in the dishwasher <laughs> Now that it works and uh, you can See what it's like and then we'll after we're after we've finished we'll see what it's like uh, once I've updated all the firmware and everything's brought up to date basically. Okay so let's switch on and see what we get. This is uh, plugged into the uh, VBXE output by the way. I had to hold the connector <laughs> and push the connector in the back, uh, push the cable in the back because it was uh, so loose on the board. So here we are we've got the uh, side PBI BIOS fairly old version and the IDEA APT Ultimate 1 Megabyte version 1.22 which for some reason doesn't display the uh, device ID after it but uh, I, th I happen to know it's on device 1 anyway. So I think later on we'll modify the uh, the firmware on the APT uh, IDEA uh, controller so that it displays the device ID as well. That'd be a nice thing to do. But yeah maybe it's well, maybe four years ago was the last time I turned it on. Maybe it's not long, as long ago as I thought. Although this may not actually be the flash ROM chip. I think I swapped the flash ROM chip over 
uh, when I was diagnosing this machine. So it hasn't even got the plug in on it anymore. Uh, for the, yeah, it's a different flash ROM. It hasn't got the plug in for the idea. Uh, it's not installed at all. So what I've done is actually these are enabled. One of the two is hooked up to the idea, so that's why it's turned on. I forgot I'd done that. Uh, so yeah, so that's why we get the um, we get the two boot messages at the top of the screen there. The reason this takes so long to uh, come up, of course, is because the hard disk driver for the side two is timing out looking for the cartridge because there isn't one installed. So we'll be putting the side three firmware with the plug-in for the idea on this machine and hopefully it'll all work and if it doesn't work I'll have to work on stabilizing the system until it does work. But yeah, I mean, uh, I think I should be able to, yes, there we go. I think, I can't remember, the keyboard's a bit stiff, yeah, definitely a bit stiff. Uh, here we go. There it is. It's found the hard disk. So that's the compact flash card on the IDEA interface. Uh, and it's on drive G. Now I think the reason... I can't think why it's having trouble. Uh, maybe if I turn off... I know what it is. So this PBI firmware here is on PBI device ID 2. Now I think... Uh, somebody will correct me if I'm wrong. Sparta DOS X pulls the PBI handlers from the highest number down to the bottom. So this driver is called first every time you access a disk. Now with this being on a higher ID and I've got the high speed SIO turned on. Uh, that's why the requests aren't getting through to the IDEA interface. So if I turn this off. I mean, the better thing to do would be to swap the the device ID so the, the ID gets called first. But for now, so if I turn this off, the access to the hard disk should work. Let's see. Right, so now if I go to drive G, because we know that's a partition. And there we go. Right, and we've got RW test. Do a speed test on that volume and it's reasonably quick. So there you go, so the hard disk actually works after all these years. Isn't that marvellous? And the format, the partitioning format, this is the good thing about standards, you see, the partitioning format for this has not changed one iota in all that time. Everything still works beautifully. Marvellous. Right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna clean the motherboard. I'll do that off screen because it's just gonna be basically taking most of the chips off the board thrown it in a dishwasher and then we'll, when that's all clean we'll come back we'll rewire uh, the top half of the board most of it anyway check all the upgrades it's obvious that you know ultimate's working and everything like that check that we'll try and find a stereo pokey board to put in this thing and uh, then i'm going to update the firmware and i'm going to add that uh, facility to the the idea driver to report the pbi bus id at boot up things like that and uh, other minor quality improvements I think the uh, the prospective buyer is absolutely entitled to expect. So uh, yeah, I'm, so I'm going to go away, clean the board, and uh, of course we need to paint the case as well. So I'm going to, uh, if, I don't, if, if I don't actually do that on camera, because it's actually going to be a big enough job to just do it at all, figure out some sort of spray paint booth or something somewhere around the house. And obviously with this being our new house, I don't want to cover it in paint. But I'll, I'll figure something out and uh, I'll try and document that on, on camera if I can. Well now, some time has elapsed and you uh, catch me hard at work here. I'm refitting this board. I did put it in the dishwasher uh, the other day and it came out absolutely beautifully. Especially things like the, the VBXE board, everything, and the, the ultimate one megabyte. They, they, they're quite old now. These were very early production boards, and they are looking absolutely gorgeous. All glossy, sparkling clean. The All the soldering that was looking a little bit tarnished before looks absolutely fantastic. Likewise, the 
uh, the idea interface here absolutely but you'd think it had just come you know come off the production line so to speak uh, absolutely lovely and um, so yes yeah, so the I tested it after I dried the board out I did test it again um, I took off uh, all the uh, all the large ICs and all the upgrade boards I put them in the in the cleaner separately on a different shelf uh, but once everything was dried I tested it again everything still worked thankfully uh, just a couple of things. Some of these cheap screws, I find that they actually start to rust uh, when they're exposed to water. So I've ordered some new um, M3 uh, 6mm screws so we can replace them. Because we might as well, because we're doing a, we're doing a deluxe preparation uh, here. This is a, a, a deluxe item that, uh, that the gentleman's going to buy. So we might as well make the effort. So, uh, so far what I decided to do, because the, this machine, this was actually the first machine that I attempted to install Rapidus in uh, when that came out uh, about six or seven years ago, I think it must have been now. Um, so there were quite a few extra little wires and connectors uh, on the board that aren't going to be needed anymore. So base, I'm, I've left this, I'm, I'm not doing this again because the... There's nothing wrong with this ribbon cable. So this is the the parallel cable for the actual uh, hard disk uh, that sits on some standoffs. I've had to order some more standoffs as well. Uh, but that sits on standoffs over here. Uh, and obviously you have your, car, your compact flash card in there like so. So I'm leaving that one. Likewise, I'm leaving uh, all the wiring on the bottom here. <laughs> I'm not in a hurry to do this again. And this particular brand of uh, IDC cable it hasn't gone yellow or anything it's absolutely perfectly fine so I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that alone I think this wire here which I'll also replace uh, this is for the hard disk activity light and that's actually wired up to the uh, the LEDs on the top of the case uh, I've completely rewired that as well so that we would get a hard disk activity light there I have replaced the the DIN 13 connector here for the VBXE output uh, I've got the little bits of shrink tubing. I won't uh, finalise that until I'm 100% sure the wiring's correct. We just need the stereo output uh, wired up to that and, and a composite sync signal from the CD4050. Um, so what I have uh, replaced up on the top here is basically all the wiring uh, other than the uh, parallel cable there. So the, the ribbon cables for the ultimate board, they've been replaced the connector for the VBXE that's been replaced and all these other wires now this bit down here now of course this little bit of architectural soldering down here is quite interesting this uh, is the modification required to produce the external select signal on the 1200 XL because it didn't originally have one now we need this for several reasons we need it for the parallel connector at the back uh, we also need it for the VBXE. We did need it for the Rapidus when I had that in. So we've got, I think it's the CAS inhibit signal. I'll have to look it up. It comes off the MMU there. So basically what we've got is, a, anyway, um, well, it would be a 74 LS weight, uh, but the original 74 LS weight has been replaced with a 74 F weight for reasons of side three compatibility, etc. Uh, and on top of that, uh, we stick another 74F08, which in Bob Woolley's original instructions would have been a, probably a 74LS08 or maybe an HC chip. I can't remember what he specified. I'll flash it up on the screen. Uh, so we cut off all but the uh, supply and ground pins. We piggy this one, piggyback this one on top of the other one. And uh, we feed this signal in here. So we have two signals fed in. We've got one fed in on pin one, one fed in on pin three, and from pin two, we get uh, external select. And we've got a 4.7K pull-up resistor down there going to five volts. You can just see it hidden behind the ribbon cable there. Uh, so this is what gives you external select. Pin one is obviously going to be CAS inhibited because I know for a fact that goes to the VBXE. So the, there's two wires coming from CAS inhibit uh, going into pin one, and one goes straight to the VBXE. Likewise, one of the external select signals will go to the VBXE down at the front here. 
And as I say, the other, the uh, the second outgoing wire goes to the parallel bus. So that's what that little thing is. There. That, now this was a mess. I had when I discovered the 74F08 uh, solution, I'd soldered that on. Um, it might have been visible in an earlier scene in the video actually, but the legs were still sticking out and everything. I hadn't trimmed them. So I've done a nice neat job with the uh, shrink fit tubing on there. Uh, so it all looks nice. So we haven't really got many more wires to add here, but of course one thing I do have to do is I'm going, if I move the board back a little bit, I'm going to have to replace this crystal here, which is the, the, the main clock crystal for the for the whole system uh, with an NTSC frequency crystal and then of course we'll have to replace the antic chip which is PAL because of course if you remember I was using um, drop checks a PAL adapter board uh, well that dates this project doesn't it 2012 so uh, I think I, I first worked on this machine about a year or two before that came out so uh, this was in the machine this is a PAL GTIA of course so we'll replace the PAL GTIA, the PAL Antic, we'll replace, replace that crystal. And I think there's a jumper, I think it might be W10, which needs to be put back, which is going to tie the colour burst frequency for GTIA, and it's going to tie it to the main clock frequency, or a, or a, a, um, a fraction thereof. And that will give us proper NTSC video back on the legacy video output. So mustn't forget to do that, of course, because this... The customer wants this machine back uh, in its essentially its stock NTSC configuration, which is quite handy. So it means I get to keep this and probably put it in uh, another 1200XL. Although I think a friend of mine has actually sent me another uh, PAL converter board, which I think came from Jürgen. TFHH. So I need to give that one a test as well, but anyway, I'm getting off the beaten track. So I think this is going to have to be a two-parter because I've still got to paint the case, uh, which is after all this uh, refit's done and assuming everything works properly, uh, that's going to be the last major job and one of the more difficult jobs, mainly because of finding somewhere in the house, uh, the new house, to do the spray paint job. Uh, which isn't going to make a mess because I don't have a I don't even have a shed or anything at the moment, and there isn't really a room in the house that I'm going to be happy to have coated in tiny little droplets of dried up spray paint. So I've got an idea anyway. I'm going to use the utility room and line it with um, dust sheets from the ceiling, and then make make myself some sort of cardboard spray booth, and then I'll put the case in and get that painted. So anyway, that's the next job, and I think uh, when we've got the case painted, and then we put the thing back together, and we'll we'll test it, and we'll try it with side three, and we'll get it all configured. And of course, the other thing, um, which I'll I'll cover in part two, is this uh, stereo board that I found. This is the megahertz stereo board. I think I mentioned it earlier. That's going to have to be wired up. If I can find another little U switch device, like the one on the back of this. Uh, idea interface. It's, it's a shame Lotharic doesn't sell these anymore because they were really handy. They basically turn uh, logic high or low into a, basically a switch, a mechanical switch function, which a lot of the older upgrades tend to need. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed that one. As I say, it's going to be a little bit easier to digest if I do it in two parts, otherwise it's just going to get completely out of hand um, with all, all the extra work that needs done here. So uh, anyway, Thanks very much for watching. Uh, thank you, of course, as always, to my patrons. So at some point we'll have part two of uh, this little series uh, when the case will be painted and hopefully it'll turn out brilliantly. We can put all the insides back in, upgrade all the firmware, get it configured to work with side three, and uh, we can actually appraise what the buyer is going to get. So thanks again, and uh, all being well, I will see you in the next video. So bye-bye for now.